Uh, well, thank you all uh, very much for uh, coming today. Uh, this session's panel discussion is entitled, Do Experts Matter? Experimentation, Expertise, and Craft Culture in the Digital Age. I'll start by giving a, a short preface to the topic uh, and introducing the speakers. Uh, before we pass around ideas between the panelists and finish with some audience questions at the end, um, if you have any. So scent development, as expressed in what we know as niche or artistic perfumery today, was unequivocally viewed as an expert practice by both the industry and its consumers when its revival in the late 70s began into the 80s with L'Artisan Parfumeur, Amouage, Parfum de Nicolai, and later Serge Lutens. They had what was seen as the best of everything at the time. The best noses, the best brand leaders, the best packaging and the best materials. Without doubt, an expert field, bedrocked on overthrowing the high commodity culture of the global beauty titans. Then came the experimental minds, Frederick Mal, Loris Ramey, Francis Kirkdijen, and uh, Etienne Desoir, who is on the panel day today. Thank you for coming, Etienne. Uh, who still relished expertise, I believe, uh, but uh, advertised in equal measure the rebellious and innovative spirits their products were conceived from. Whilst experimentation may still be high in the landscape of today's uh, niche scent making, many feel that niche is losing expertise. It has competition in terms of the best quality materials from larger beauty institutions. The highest qualified and most celebrated perfumers are working on commercial briefs most of the time. And the DIY headspace, experimental vigor, and simplistic aesthetic, which were Niche's foremost attractions in the past, may have undermined the blueprints of balance, polish, and fine-tuning that previously characterized know-how and refinement in perfumery. Not to mention that the role of the connoisseur rightly died many years ago. Is the central issue that experimentation breeds ignorance and naivety or that there is no such thing as expertise in fragrance at all, because scents cannot be scrutinized with the same rigor as other sensory or artistic experiences. Well, we, we will return to this problem uh, in the panel, but first, I just want to offer a few thoughts on why niche exists at all. An argument can be made that we're here, at Essence, in an environment that celebrates emotional and intellectual stimulation from smells, because of craft culture which can be defined as the rejuvenated attention and appreciation given to objects, activities, and practices that emphasize human input and emotional significance with unique markings and oddities indicating knowledge that is often only passed down through actively doing rather than theoretically thinking. Craftspeople are famed for their hands-on material-specific expertise, but not efficiency. Corporations are relied on for scientific expertise, but not creativity. It is within this cultural biosphere that we have burgeoning appetite for neo-craft beer, craft coffee, craft burgers, craft jam, craft furniture, etc. Reflecting that in 2019, millennials and Gen Z in particular are interested in people, the romance within history, the value of creativity, and questioning what true creativity means. This could be viewed as an antithetical weapon to push back against the relentless homogeny of mass production and monotony, as represented in something like The Matrix as a form of late capitalism. However, an alternative explanation for craft culture borrows from the post-World War II atmosphere of deconstruction and questioning to offer ideological disintegration as the cause of craft culture's revival. In 2019, when it doesn't matter if God exists or not, what gender or sexuality you are or are not, whether you have a home or live as a digital nomad, or choose to reject education and expectation in favor of experience and mindful living, excess of freedom puts aspirations, dreams, and identity routine in crisis. When there is no right and wrong, you can do whatever you want and you only have choices. And in that situation, identity often comes into crisis. What is happening today is not exactly the same as the 1950s, 
as those stereotypes were still stalwarts for how identity was formed. The World War II generation might have lost their innocence, but we arguably have lost our purpose. So the recourse to appreciating small human activity within the crafts and the humanity about it makes more sense in this context. When there is no omniscient guiding force lighting life's path when things get difficult, what you do, what you are, your creativity and your personal mark on the world really matters. Matters to such an extent that I believe the concept of curating personal creativity and creative living has replaced theistic leanings for some generations via social media and the compulsion to prove that your life matters through obsessive documentation. Smell also fits that bill, promoting mindful thinking that encourages self-exploration and focuses on subjectivity, memory, and self-presentation. It is also within this context that expertise is lost, meaning very little to those that seek rejection of facts and the tried and tested in favor of gut feelings and emotional truths. In 2019, Instagram shows us that I am is all that really matters. Experimentation, on the other hand, is thriving in both perfumery circles and beyond. So to discuss some of the, some or, or none of the issues I've introduced um, is our panel of experts and experimenters, uh, starting with uh, Etienne Desoir uh, on my immediate right, who is the uh, founder of uh, Etalie d'Orange. Um, next along is Saskia Wilson-Brown, founder of the Institute for Art and Olfaction. After that is perfumer Mark Buxton, and at the end is uh, Bibi Preval, who is in evaluation in fine fragrance for the uh, house uh, man. So I just wanted to start um, a question to the panel by asking, uh, when did you start feeling like experts, if you ever did? And uh, what does expertise mean in your job, or how are you striving for expertise in your job? Well, I, I don't think I'm an expert at all, so my only expertise is, in, is in amateurism, perhaps, ironically. So I'm an expert of amateurism. Um, so that's my answer. Do you think expertise is important for the Institute for Art and Olfaction as a concept? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I started the Institute with a sort of anti-expertise sort of... Um, anarchistic approach, uh, which I quickly learned was the wrong approach, because actually expertise matters. And in that sense, uh, we, it's important for the Institute, but not at the expense of access. So, and we can talk about that more later. So for you, you would say that access takes priority over maybe some other categories when you're thinking about programs, you're thinking about what's important for, for SEN and the people coming to you. Well, my position isn't that clear, but I think that if, if perfumery is an art, then art is a human right, and in that sense, expertise for us would come second to our mission to create access to the right that people have to create, in this case, with perfume. Okay, I appreciate that. What, what about the rest of you? For example, um, uh, Bibi, as a, an evaluator, um, uh, like, wh when did you start feeling like an expert evaluator versus one who's training? Because I'm very interested in the idea of training the sense of smell. I do think it's true that we don't learn how to smell the way we learn how to appreciate music when we're young or, or how to see. Mm -hmm. So there's a critical nose or, or critical vision that, that perhaps needs to be adapted. And yes, your, your experiences and your memory greatly influence your, your sense of smell. But in many ways, I think it's uh, so counterintuitive and, and almost laughable when, when uh, people with big positions at big companies will say, I'm the scent, I know how to smell better, better than you do because I can smell, I can identify more materials, but that has nothing to do with, in my view, interpretation, which is in a different angle. So wh when did you start feeling like an important evaluator rather than a, a junior evaluator? Um, I think when I got my own office, that was sort of... Yeah, yeah, I've never had one before, so congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I entered the industry with a love of fragrance and not a, an averagely skilled nose. Um, and I was trained and I, would, you know, I learned to be able to smell once I got there. And the perfumers I worked with trained me on the ingredients and then sort of years on the job gave me the expertise, if I'm gonna say expertise, but I don't have the kind of nose that can dissect 
you know, down to final notes. I wasn't trained at a Zipka. Um, I sit in my office next door to a 26-year-old whose nose is like a bloodhound. So I will say, hey, something's wrong here. Can you tell me what it is? Um, does that make her more of an expert than me? I don't know. Maybe. Um, but when I switched houses, they didn't see me as someone who had been trained, you know, so you start your career somewhere and they sort of see you as junior and they watch your career grow and you get more skill. Um, but then when I came into this other company, they just saw me sort of as the new evaluator, the new senior evaluator and deferred to me as if I was an expert. And I think that was the moment that I felt like an expert. I hate that it was defined by someone else, but it was. I'm really fascinated in this uh, simile that appears everywhere in the industry, like having a nose like a dog, and I certainly don't. I, I believe my nose is, is about average. Um, but uh, I, I don't understand why the industry developed this tradition for testing people in this way and considering that smelling or identifying materials within a composition trump everything else about what it means to mix materials to create an effect for the reason that if you apply to go to art school no one is going to give you an eye exam if you want to be a musician you need to be able to hear but no one will ever test the capability or uh, uh, acuteness of your hearing they test accuracy and how you can identify forms and structures so like uh, and i'd love to get mark's opinion on this as well why why or is it important to know uh, uh, mater materials to study materials when it when you're training as a perfumer <laughs> Well, it's, fortunately, it's part of our job. I mean, it's like a musician. You can't uh, compose anything without knowing the notes and then the accords, and then before you can do your own composition. If I think back that I went to school for five years, internal school, to learn this stuff, what I'm trying to do today, and I'm still learning. So uh, I think it's a tough job, and it's a long way. And I remember when they sent me to Paris, because I, I went to internal school in Germany. And um, when I launched my first fragrance, or I won my first fragrance for the group I was working for at the time, I thought to myself, I was very proud, of course, but I thought to myself, my God, this can't be it. And it, had, it had nothing to do with expertise, if I thought I was ready or not, but I just thought to myself, this can't be it. <coughs> I... Um, uh, fell lucky and I won a fragrance, um, the first fragrance for Comme des Garçons. And that's when I noticed that I got recognition from the other side, from critics, from people from the other side. And that's when I said to myself, now I'm ready. I mean, um, where do you think the greatest expertise is uh, found within the scent development process? Because people, uh, and there are a variety of reasons for this, I know, but it's very popular to herald perfumers as artists and therefore give them all the creative uh, responsibility, all of the praise, uh, and not just in terms of um, thinking innovatively, but also in terms of the, the sharpness of their brain. Um, they're really lauded on a pedestal today. Do you think that's, that's correct? Or um, where for you is, is the greatest expertise required in the whole development process for scent from growing right down to the bottle? Like who do you think has the, the job that needs the most experience? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the perfumer of course plays a big role in this. I mean, uh, if you have your finished product at the end of the day, uh, I think the fragrance has to be correct. It has to have the right quality. It has to have the right diffusion, etc. But um... but what about this idea that perfumers happen upon uh, creative accords by accident? Do you think that requires expertise? Because th there are so many instances yeah, well, about you can overdoses. Come and say like these self-made perfumers, uh, I don't know, which do some kind of a course for three months somewhere or buy some kit over internet, study that, and then bang a few things together and think that that's how you create a fragrance. I disagree with that, but everybody does what he wants. I'm not here to criticize them. You see what I mean? But um, it's difficult to say. Everybody gets judged. Uh, your work gets judged every day, and you know you can't uh, please everybody, whatever you do, whatever you create. I think if I look at uh, this fair today, I think that 70% um, is shit. I'm honest. 
I think that we're starting to copy each other in the niche, and I think that it's not what we should be doing. We should be hedonists, we should be upfront there, and we should be doing new things to stay upfront. We have to lead and not follow. And that's why I'm turning down more and more briefs in this because I'm going somewhere else. Then there's something else to do out there, more abstract work. And that's what we're looking for at the moment, or that's what I'm looking for at the moment. I really want to continue on, on your idea of talking about creativity and, and innovation. But just, just before that, I, I want to um, get Etienne's opinion on, um, uh, as a, a leader of a, a brand, um, wh who do you think has the, the most uh, Expert, that the most expertise are required in, in the development process. For, for you as a, as a creative director, do you think that the, the, the perfumer is still the kind of genius driving the creation or how much input do you, do you have? So uh, if expertise is based on flop, traps and bankruptcy, I'm very good, I'm a talented expert. So uh, no, I prefer, I prefer to stay naive when you truly become an expert, I think that you lose that enthusiasm and naive, naivete, naivety. So I prefer to say that uh, let's stay a lost in translation and being far away of pretending that you are an expert. Because when you are a true expert, you can foresee the traps and you don't go. So uh, I prefer to say that the more I can stay naive and absolutely need not an expert, then, uh, then I'm on the lucky side and the creative side. So no, I don't want to be an expert because I think I'm going to be trapped. And I uh, prefer to become a doc seater than to become an expert. I, I like that answer, and that's exactly what I wanted to, to ask Bibi. Like, do you feel trapped sometimes by your own expertise? Like, Mark was mentioning the idea that in order to, to not be uh, copies of, of everything else uh, out there, um, you need to try and break boundaries when you're combining accords or, or try and push for something more. But do you think that, re that requires an expert mind or do you think that kind of requires a mind that doesn't have the experience that Mark does or, or that you do and can see things in a different light as Etienne is suggesting? Um, I think I'm lucky because I'm a consumer of fragrance at heart and always will be. So the benefit of, I guess, when I work on a project is I, it's sort of like, do I want to buy it? Do I want to wear it? Who's going to wear it? Will, you know, will they love it? Have I smelled it before? And I'm really looking often for, have I smelled this before? That said, I work on a lot of really commercial brands and they're not going to be happy if I hand them something somebody's never smelled before. Um, so it's, you know, it's a back and forth there. I have to sort of play in the middle. But I also work on the niche accounts that come into our house, which keeps me really happy. <laughs> um, but something that Mark was saying about what's out there, it's hard. I mean, I know we've all gone back and forth on the definition of niche. And is niche how many stores you're sold in, how high the price point is, how creative it is, one of those, all of those, you know? Um, and that sort of delineates more whether it should smell like something you've never smelled before. Because maybe it's just a commercial brand that's sold in four places, you know? I mean, do you, do you think um, consumers actually feel expertise in juices? So you have, you have a perfumer that's uh, uh, greatly celebrated for their ability to, to, to win briefs and also make uh, creative niche juices. He, he works on a project, uh, she works on a project that she feels is, is successful. Um, do you think the consumer feels that there was a big team behind it with a lot of knowledge and experience versus maybe a, a junior perfumer or someone who's had no perfumery training at all? Combines some uh, materials in perfumer's alcohol, creates a, a, a cologne. What is the, do you think the consumer who isn't uh, trained in perfumery feels a cologne made by Dominic Ropion versus a cologne made by uh, me? Yeah. Um, I don't think the consumer realizes how lucky they are, actually, um, that the finest of fine fragrance perfumers are also making their Victoria's Secret body splashes, um, or even their soaps. And you know, they, I don't think they have any concept that they're doing it all. Um, I think you can smell it. I mean, you can definitely smell some perfumers' signatures. Sometimes they're not allowed in the really commercial items. I don't know. I'd actually, I'm stumped on that one. I'm not sure. But if you can, be happy because you can smell it and they're really good. 
I mean, Saskia, kind of following on from that point, I was interested in your, your um, ideas about whether access to materials or processes and education puts this expertise in risk or whether it in increases expertise. Because there's this a big movement of uh, uh, teaching uh, people the rudiments of perfumery online, as well as new platforms in order for people to buy their own materials, which is reflected in uh, places like Essence with, with so many uh, self-taught perfumers. Um, winning commissions for brands as well as representing themselves. Do you think that makes the whole industry uh, like greater experts or does it kind of question in some ways Mark's experience? Well, before I worked, at, I started the Institute, I worked at a TV network and my job was to create, uh, to find filmmakers to create on-air content and it was a democratization of the media. And I was very excited about it and I was like, yeah, you know, the media needs to be open and and what I found, you know, six, seven years later, when I became a little more jaded, was that, oh shit, we created a monster. All my friends who are journalists are out of work. We're getting, you know, quote unquote, fake news. And the democratization of media was a real, it has become, in my opinion, somewhat of a problem. You know, that's all I can say about it. You know, I mean, there is a role for, there is an important place for people who know what they're doing. But again, that doesn't mean that other people don't have a right to, to try in a different way. And speaking a little bit to Etienne's idea of the naïf, you know, that naïveté can sometimes, rarely, but sometimes it can engender new things, which, which then an expert can understand with a higher level of, of application. And, and also, my last point quickly, and then I'll pass it along, is there's different kinds of experts, you know? There's like the rebel expert, uh, then, there's the, then there's the expert who's amazing at the materials and there's the value, you know, evaluate. And, and it kind of all depends on what, it, it doesn't really matter, you know what I mean? As long as it's, I don't know, I don't know what I'm saying, so I'll stop. I, I, I do agree, it's, it's a complicated issue because um, that there is a consumer for um, self-taught perfumers as well as that there is a consumer for, for mass brands that have maybe a more polished or, or more, more rounded or what some perfumers might think is a, a balanced um, uh, palette or impression. Um, kind of guided more towards uh, BB and Mark, how do you feel about self-taught perfumers? Like, what do you think they bring to the table or, or what handicaps do they have? Um, uh, Self-taught perfumers. Not much. They don't bring much to the table, and why is that? As I said before, I, I don't see the interest. I mean, it's it's too easy. It's. Can I ask you a controversial question then? Is perfumery easy? No, it's not. Why not? It's like I said before. It's. Uh, matter of experience, how chemicals work together, uh, how accords work together, and nothing to do that you, you don't dare or you can, yes, things can happen by accident or overdose or something like that, but it, it's not just expertise. For, for me, perfumery is creativity, and creativity you can't learn. Either you have it or you don't have it. Anybody can become a perfumer. We all have a nose, we can all smell. The only difference between a perfumer, a trained perfumer, is we've been training for bloody 5, 10, 15, 20 years. That's the only difference. Well, what is the difference between a creative and an average and a shitty perfumer is your creativity. You can't learn that. You have to see things in a different light. You have to try to think the opposite. A lot of people, a lot of perfumers are like sheep. A lot of humans are like sheep. When you get out of the airport, you have six doors. And everybody arrives to the six doors. The first one there, they open this door, and you'll see there's a queue behind all these doors. They all want to get through that one door, but they all six work. See what I mean? There's too much following and not leading. And that's what I try to express with my perfumery. Just think out of the box and try to be different. But it has nothing to do with expertise. What do you think about self-taught perfumers, Bibi? In, in relation to the perfumers, for example, you work with and their ability to produce creativity? Um, I think it depends on the self-taught perfumer. I think that there, I also think it's hard to define expertise and self-taught. I mean, if someone has really taken the time and gone through learning perfumery on their own and they've done their due diligence, then I guess they're also considered self-taught. 
um, versus someone like you said, just you know, just like I want to be a perfumer and throw something together. But right, there is right, and then anyone could be a perfumer. But I think there has to be some sort of. I think it has to be placed in history. You know, you have to know what's come before you. But then I, part of me thinks, no, you don't. You really don't. You could just make something really wonderful first time out. Does that make you a great perfumer? I don't think so. I think it makes you lucky. Um, I mean, Saskia, have you ever had anyone come to one of your programs and create a scent that you've smelled and just on a personal level, nothing else, you thought like, wow, like if this were in a bottle, it would sell uh, a million fold. Um, this, this is genius. They've created something that if Mark gave it to me, I would think uh, he's blown me away. He used, he's used all of his experience to create an, an imbalance at the top with a really unusual combination in the base that, that's given me a, a memory of an old scent that, that I wore when I, was, when I was younger, as well as a, a new accord here. They know nothing, though. They've just rocked up like... Tch. Has that ever happened before? Um, as a non-expert, I wouldn't be qualified to judge. <laughs> But um, probably not. However, I will say a lot of perfumes that come through the awards mechanism who are, that are made by first-time perfumers or, I don't know, the self-trained self thing. I mean, you know, if you sit there and you, and you study the chemistry without a teacher, you just study it and you study the notes and you do all your due diligence, self-taught is, you know, it makes you an expert. It just means that you are your own trainer versus somebody else. I mean, who... It's sort of like, are you only an expert because someone who's considered an expert teaches you, or are you an expert because you, because you care enough to learn, you know? So I don't know, it's, it's complicated, you know? But no, the answer is no. And what, what about yourself, Etienne? Um, another thing that I think you read a lot in, in perfumer interviews is that somehow people, um, uh, they, they love to praise the process when it's quick, especially if you're talking about something like uh, <laughs> Hermes and, and their kind of style. Um, I know that often Jean-Claude Elena or Christine Agel would go through uh, so many trials, but especially um, in, uh, in popular narratives and in news reporting, somehow perfumers are heralded as, as geniuses if they can get to the formula quickly. I just sketched it out. And also in niche, people often talk about a, a quick formula or a short formula be, being more beautiful. Short formula. Uh, or quick. Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you think about this topic in reference to the sense you've developed? Uh, which, how many have been co long, complicated processes and which have been uh, short, quick? I think that there is, the, there is one single perspective. Um, it's, you know, the, uh, the massive investment. If you put a lot of money on the table, you need a lot of safety. So at the end of the day, the process and, your, and, and dealing with time, you will extend time. So you can go fast when, when, when you, the, the cash that you put on the table is not that much risky. So when you are Hermes or LVMH or Estée Lauder and you have to launch a big, uh, you know, a big program by putting 100 million euro on the table. So at the end of the day, you go for maximum consensuality, maximum safety, and you double check everything. You have, so you have to be a paranoiac on different levels. So at the end of the day, it's the question of, it's a, you know, Time, you can go fast if you don't play a lot of money. But when you put a, a lot of money and a lot of marketing support, you have to, be, you have to go through maximum safety process. I, mean, I, I think that, that's, a, that's a fair approach. Um, uh, out of all of your formulas, which one was the quickest to, to make in terms of time with a perfumer? Secrétion magnifique was the easiest way. Is that not uh, exactly the point I'm trying to illustrate? I, I didn't know that was the case, but uh, that is the one perfume that, that gained uh, recognition for your brand. I, I think it's the perfume that's a uh, commercial perfume that's referenced as an artwork more than any I've seen uh, uh, um, in, in, in history, um, in contemporary perfumery. Uh, how were you able to arrive at something so quickly then? Oh, because it, it, you know, I started the idea a long time ago in the 80s, you know, during the... Uh, the AIDS age when I was a, a teen, so I got that story from, from quite a long time. So I discussed that story at LVMH, and the idea was to launch you know, such a concept under the name Virus. So they were very excited, but it was slightly too risky, given the financial flow they were ready to put on it, and you know, that they called it the, the risk of the goodwill. So I decided to you know, work that idea for LVMH, then uh, they, they said, no, we don't want to go. Then I've evoked that idea with Antoine Lee, and, and the idea was to express everything about the viral risk, and Antoine was excited. So you can speed up time with emotion. Cash, obviously, from time to time, but you speed up time with emotion. If you have the emotion, then 
your movement is life and you can go fast. But I do want to ask you, one thing I think is interesting is that you have, uh, in, in what you just said, you, you, you mentioned story, concept, idea. This is what was driving it. Did you need Antoine Lee to create the smell? Or do you think you could have found a, a first year Asipka student that would have made, not the same obviously, but a smell that would have sufficiently satisfied the concept? No, no, definitely. The talent of Antoine Lee was welcome on board, definitely. In, in what way was he talented in the process? The ping pong, the ping pong you can have with them. You know, you can challenge and you can respond. It's like a tennis, you know, it's a, like a tennis game. So I'm not a perfumer, but I know their language and I try to pick up uh, ideas or angularities to leverage their emotion. So it's a ping pong game. And Antoine is a very good ping pong player. I, I really like the, the, actually what, what you mentioned because uh, I do agree that um, there is a shared language and shared, shared history and shared understanding that can, can maybe speed things up quickly and can also make someone, uh, uh, it can validate the idea of, of creativity because they're able to arrive at solutions very fast using all of their experience. I mean, for me personally, um, a, a couple of perfumers have, have answered this question in, in the past. Um, there's a self-taught perfumer actually called Pierre Long from uh, the UK who once described perfumery as uh, endless puzzle solving or, or problem solving. Um, I think Isabel Doyen perhaps described it as, as a puzzle and for me the, the best answer was from Alex Lee from, from Man uh, who, who's doing something here uh, this uh, this event. Um, I asked him once why he thought um, Jean-Claude Anna was so, so celebrated and he said that um, he did not think geniuses existed uh, in perfumery, um, that the, the, the concept didn't fit uh, his job, that um, the only way a genius could be, um, the only way you could be called a genius is if you were able to arrive at the solution to um, uh, juices and formulations quickly. The experience of a perfumer is how to f fill the brief and fulfill the, the, uh, the idea of the brand as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, because you've had all of that experience of smelling and going through the process. Um, but not that there was some idea of an overarching creative genius. Uh, and I also believe part of the, the, this problem can be solved by what people are being taught in perfumery schools. I really think it's absolutely ridiculous that people are taught um, to smell materials endlessly for years and to be marked on the knowledge of, of their materials because all they're doing is identifying. Uh, artists are not taught the composition of every single uh, color so that they can understand the balance between all the other colors endlessly. Uh, a musician is not taught the frequencies of uh, pitches so that they can match them perfectly or scientifically most harmoniously in a, in a, in a musical work. Um, they're primarily taught about interpretation and response to try and connect the physical uh, material that they're dealing with in the medium with the intended response and how to but, achieve that response most successfully. And I don't think perfumers are taught that. Don't chefs learn the taste of each ingredient before they put them together? That is true, but I still think that the, the um, celebration of a chef is in the effect they're able to achieve and, and the, that their emph the emphasis on their, uh, their craft and how, how they do that is on that end effect, on that achievement of it, not on the individual materials. Right, but like their final meal or the final perfume that comes out. I, I think knowing notes um, is important because in perfumery you have to know how the note is going to affect the other notes. And that I don't understand at all, and they do. And that is this sort of, for me, crazy knowledge. Like, how'd you learn that? Um, and I think they learned it by studying deeply and not only smelling these things, but learning the, you know, chemistry shape and the link. And this is an, uh, you know, an I aldehyde, and this is a alcohol, and this is a, and that. All, all that knowledge like fuses in their brains and does something special. It is a bit of a cliche, but so many evaluators and, and perfumers, um, let's say there is a, a proportion of the population that says chemistry is absolutely useless for perfumery. So what, what is the defense of it? Why do you really need to know chemical structures when what you're doing, what you should be doing, is evaluating effects for the end response? It has nothing to do with, with chemistry as far as I'm concerned. I, well, I think, it, I mean, the ones who know chemistry are the ones that somehow, when I have questions, I go to. Um, it's also when you have to replace ingredients, knowing the chemistry of them, I think, I don't, you tell me, does that aid 
if you have to take one out because you know, you're not allowed to use it anymore and you have to put something else in, you want something of a similar shape, obviously a similar smell. Um, and I think the more you know about anything, a deeper understanding of anything only aids the situation rather than takes away from it. I do think, in my opinion, though, the understanding and the expertise is misplaced, once again. I feel that if you're able to um, uh, de deconstruct a formula, you're able to, to really quickly uh, develop a, a, a new rose with a green accent because of your experience, that's great. But for me, that is just problem solving. In fact, the job is more similar to an engineer or mathematician than it is an artist because you, perfumers I believe in the majority of cases across commercial and niche, of course there are exceptions, but in the majority of cases, they're not dealing with ideas because of an essential limitation to the sense of smell. Perfumery is not able, in my opinion, and I'd love to hear if you agree or not, it is not able to make points. It is only able to solve problems. So if you have the concept of uh, a milky strawberry, now this is your problem because you don't have uh, apart from man has some uh, materials, but generally you, you wouldn't have a natural strawberry available and uh, strawberry doesn't really smell so creamy or you want to make it a, a lot more creamier. So you have a problem as a perfumer, you, you go to your knowledge, boom, you can solve it quickly. If you're experienced, you can do it. But there is, you're saying creamy strawberry, that, that's what you're saying with the perfume. Maybe you're pulling on associations, maybe you're pulling on some cross-modal correspondences, maybe you're pulling on some uh, innate feelings of disgust or pleasure, but what you're really saying is creamy strawberry. What a chef can do is different, because they're playing with more than, than one sense. Uh, arrangement on the plate, and because of visuality, can communicate more complicated ideas. Uh, I think I've, I've spoken about this before. You can never have a feminist perfume because you can't communicate ideas in perfumery. And that what really sh perfumers should be learning is interpretation and how to manipulate that. Nothing to do with materials. One week, I'd say. What do you guys think about whether perfumery can communicate ideas? Like, what, what do you think, Mark? Like, your, the, the scent that you think is your greatest masterpiece, how did you try to weave ideas into it? Or do you think it was more technically or, or materially bound to what, what you're trying to do with materials rather than in the realm of concepts? Because uh, by coincidence, um, Bibi uh, mentioned something to me just before we came in here. She said, uh, we don't, we'd just met before, first time, haven't met before. And she said, I'm a big admirer of yours because um, you made something very crazy a long time ago called Model Christ Jut Hindo, something like that. And it was a, um, a creation to capture all religions, what religions would smell like, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I made that fragrance and lost what was the question again, why I'm talking about this now, totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> lost your translation. It was with your, with, with this scent, for example, um, how did you, uh, during the process, how uh, did you feel like you were engaging with ideas or concepts versus how you're engaging with materials only. Yeah, because um, there was this product which just came out, a new chemical on the market called Javanol. It's a very strong um, sandal body, and everybody was using it in the company like in 1% and 10%. And I thought to myself, that's bullshit. It's such a great sandal body. So I used a big overdose in there of this sandal wood. But if, you, if I look back and look at the formula, I think it's so cleverly balanced these weird products in there um, that I say to myself, yeah, it was unique somehow and totally thought through and it wasn't made for the big mass. I think uh, my biggest success I've ever been not for the big mass. I don't think I'm a mass guy. <laughs> I don't think I'm not, I'm not very good at that. They only made 200 bottles, for example. <laughs> I mean, uh, if, if Eddie, we... Eddie, um, uh, there is one thing which is funny, and I keep on saying that. In our industry, I love to say that there is a, a small or a beautiful level of imposture. That means that when, when talking about femininity, uh, masculinity in perfume, there is, no, uh, there is no border. So you pretend that it's a female perfume, you pretend that it's a... Uh, a, a man perfume. So I think that there is a high level of post-rationalization. We say in French, that means that you can, you can 
do your own storytelling from a formulation. So that level of imposture, which is sad on one side, is beautiful on the other side. And here in our perfume industry, and I think that Unilever uh, and, and those big players such as uh, Procter & Gamble, they saw it, they saw through it before us, and they went into that industry and they have distorted the industry by massive injection because they knew that it was a beautiful land of, of uh, fantasy, a beautiful land of post-rationalization. So with one visual, with one storytelling, I can put any kind of formulation somehow. So I love that black and white, um, uh, what do you call that, that black and white uh, landscape of imposture of our perfume industry. Our olfactive sense is quite poor. We are missing that minimum level of vocabulary to express an emotion. We are in a total lack of explanation, something objective. So it becomes a land of magical speech, poetry, and imposture. And I think it's very beautiful. We, I love that, once again, that black and white universe of uh, fantasy in between lost, in between objectivity and subjectivity. So that's the, my definition of, of the perfume industry. But you have, you have a, a lot of scientists, a lot of physicians and things like that. But on top of that, it's a land of imposture. Uh, I mean, on, on if, I could, if I could also just add that actually I think that the real experts in the perfume industry are when the perfumers that interpret the briefs, but also the people who know how to communicate that to the public. Because, I mean, we're all in the perfume world here, so we're all like, oh, yeah, we get it. But you take some conceptual idea, and I work a lot with public, public, public at large, and you take some idea like, oh, uh, this is Buddhism. If you don't explain that, oh, I like it, it smells good. You know, that's how people respond in the world. So the, the communicators are really, to my mind, the ones that are, are kind of the unsung experts in perfumery, you know, uh, in addition, of course, to the, to the perfumers and the evaluators. I, I, Not I, me, though. I, I like that point. Um, and it does bring us nicely to, to kind of the, the, the other part of this talk, which is experimentation. Um, so I'm curious in the, the panel's idea of um, uh, why you think consumers today are interested in experimentation, in, in, in niche, in, in essence. Uh, why, why are people interested in scents that are doing different things or making them think differently? Um, and how in your jobs do you try to be experimental if you have room to do that? For me, I find it very funny when I see the majority of the people here, uh, they just come and they're hunting for money and to find a brand uh, to make a lot of success and stuff like that. And then there's a, a small group of people which are totally freaks and it's so much pleasure talking to them because they're so interested and intrigued by things and they're interested in, in perfumery and what, what it's all about. But the majority of the people, they're just looking to make money. I can tell you my brand makes no money, you know? but I don't care. It's, it's my part of my life, so see what I mean? I just want to communicate and with what I do with my work and, uh, and I always find it so interesting that every time I meet so many people, they know more about myself than I know about myself. So they're really deep in this shit, you know, so that's what I think is cool. We don't need money. <laughs> I was, I was gonna say that I think experimentalism and capitalism aren't necessarily friends, you know? Like it's very, I think it's, I mean, some people have succeeded. I feel like Ted Yves d'Orange has been very experimental. I mean, the, certainly the topics you're putting out are not mainstream, you know? But, and, but I think that if you're trying to make money, I mean, it's dangerous to be experimental, you know? It's scary, because you, people won't, people maybe won't like it. Most people probably won't like it. They'll think it's weird. Sometimes I almost feel like the, um uh, predisposition of experimentation is, uh, is, is a lack of money sometimes. And that relationship is very complicated. I feel like experimenters love to complain about the lack of money, but that can be very inspiring. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated in your, your vision. If uh, all the people working um, in experimental practices in scent got funding and the world was just a different place tomorrow, like how do you think perfumery uh, would look different? Do you think that um, institutions or structures would, would change? Do you think consumer appetite would change? All the perfumers that didn't have enough money for their crazy composition got it. Uh, Saskia was awarded uh, $1 billion from the Trump administration for services to the arts. Like how would, how would that change the landscape? Or would it remain largely the same? So, uh 
at the end, we don't care. I think that here in our niche or creative industry, perfume is, is a, a kind of pretext, pretext for emotion, pretext for just feeling alive, useful. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic, uh, some kind of uh, anti-despair product. And uh, so we do perfume as a pretext, and a pretext of emotion, and a pretext of communication. That's a good way to communicate. You expand communication with a perfume. And uh, yes, perfume as, as or by a pretext could be a definition of our niche industry. And the selective massive industry could be a perfume for cash, somehow, and uh, perfume for return on investment. And here we do not start for for return investment. I've got plenty of people, they come to Italie d'Orange and they say, oh, we just want to launch a perfume. And I said, protect your cash, don't go. Just do something else. Because at the end of the day, you want to do a perfume and if you are cash or money driven oriented, you won't get your money back or at least you will get your money back 10 years after the launch, if you stay alive. So uh, there is a, it's difficult to outsmart time in the niche industry. There is no recipe. So if you are just about to launch a new perfume, don't go. <laughs> So, so it could be, a, could be a best way to, or if you go, don't expect any return on investment. And if you go, use the money of somebody else. Don't use your own money, not your grandmother money. Protect your family money and try to uh, seduce somebody, a rich billionaire, and then you just you give a kiss and you take his money and you, and you uh, what do you call that? Run. Because Run. I've, even, I've noticed that, that more and more brands which approach us, they, ask, they, have exactly, they know exactly what they want, but then could you make it a bit more commercial, like a bit more easier, you know, that we, we have to get the big mass, you know, we have to sell and stuff like that. See what I mean? We're driving away from all this stuff here. That's what they're asking for. And all these distributors come, yeah, but your brand, you know, it's a bit complicated and blah, 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 blah. Hey, I love his stuff. Yeah, you have to smell it, you have to think about it, you have to get into the fragrance. You see what I mean? Uh, we, we don't need anything which is gonna, everybody's gonna say, oh yeah, this is nice, well, why not? Yeah, yeah, he's right. We don't make money. <laughs> I, I feel your, your discontent, and I think the last question I wanna ask anyone on the panel who wants to chime in before we- No, I'm not, no, I'm not discontent. No? I'm not, no, I'm not discontent, frustrated. Okay. Frustrated. I feel your frustration. Yeah, so I am frustrated, and that's I, why I said right at the beginning that I'm going somewhere else, because this is boring. If I was able to alleviate that for you, then what do you think um, the f future of perfumery will or should look and smell like? What do you think the future of, of fragrance is then, or should be? There, there is no, not an exact future or an exact direction or trend or anything like that. It's just... Um, that I'm looking more for, I, I like, for example, I love to make um, fragrances for films. I think it's totally challenging how a film smell all of a sudden. I then say, wow, well, how can you, you know, get this together? I'm not gonna tell you how I do it, but <laughs> anyway, like stuff like that, or for big industry, um, been approached by a group uh, making dustbins and um, bus shelters and stuff like that for, um, for airports. How does all this stuff smell? I am looking for more of this uh, extreme kind of stuff at the moment. So, everybody does what he wants, but um, yeah, I'm more frustrated. When I smell another fragrance, it's another Fleur d'Angers, it's another Jasmine, and it's another Queer, and it's another Incense. Yeah, so what? Just the packaging is nicer, it's more expensive, and the name is fancy and stuff like that. Yeah, it, I am frustrated. No, there is something funny. I, you know, when you have somebody is just about to, to do a perfume and he has 100 or 200,000 euros and he's ready to spend. And usually they talk about the grandmother and they say, you know, I remember the orange blossom of my grandmother and I remember that and that. And then, then it was that beautiful woody atmosphere in the apartment of my grandmother. You know, and I looked at the girl or the boy and I said, are you the daughter of Bill Gates? No, so, and she said, no, no, no. Oh, are you related to Bill Gates or somebody very rich? Because you are so fucking boring. <laughs> and what I would like to say is, when you go into that speech, you have to keep in mind that there is a master and you will never, never overcome the master. And the master is Marcel Proust. So if you want, if, if you have somebody to talk about the grandmother and everything, 
And I said, stop, stop, I prefer to read Proust. You cannot beat Proust, so go and fight somewhere else. So please, if one day you plan to do a perfume, not, do not mention your, um, what do you call that, regression on your grandmother or your Madeleine of Proust, because somebody did it 100 years ago and he did 10 times better than you. So keep that phrase in mind, fuck Proust. <laughs> I, I actually completely agree with that sentiment. I think Proust did a disservice to what perfumery is and should be for this reason of this fetishization of the olfactive experience. I do not believe it should be about fondling old memories and materials just simply for, for their beauty. For me, creativity has a goal. It is not goalless. Creativity is not Picasso sitting in his room trying to be a child. Creativity is for me trying to make a change and achieving that change with your experience, with your expertise, and then maybe a little bit of a gut of experimentation that potentially is the uh, real root of creativity in the brain. Having said that, I hear you. We're actually gonna do a bingo card at the Institute and one of them is like, it reminds you of your grandmother. The other one is, have you read Perfume by Suskind? You know, the other one is, sorry, Secrétion Magnifique. No, 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 no. Have you smelled Secrétion? Yes. Do you know who smells? Yes. But having said that, you know, people have a right to do it in the way they want. And, you know, if creativity is not memory, then probably three quarters of the world's artists wouldn't bother to. There's this thing in art school, I went to art school, and the first year in art school, what you do is you do your self-portrait, and then you, then you grow up, right? That's what they say. Like, oh yeah, first get through your year of narcissism, and then make art. And maybe for people, this is the way in, and maybe that's all right, you know? Even though it's, of course, exhausting to hear it over and over again. So sorry, but... Fair point. I guess they don't, but you don't try to sell your self-portrait, right? You don't try to sell your self-portrait of your first year in art school. No, if you're smart, no. Right. Um, can I just jump back quickly to your milky strawberry? Yeah, sure. That, that'll think I'll have to be the last comment before oh, we okay. uh, put it across. So what if the concept had been um, give us the smell of a teenage girl and the perfumer came up with this milky strawberry concept and that is what they felt you know, brought, brought that through. So I sort of felt that you were saying that a milky strawberry is just a milky strawberry without the marketing or being told the concept to begin with. I think then it can be, you know, a budding 12-year-old, which is so gross, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that, but do you know what I mean? I, I, th I think that, that, is, that is true, and, and that's a point well made in that um, you can't avoid the fact that perfumery is more than just the juice. I think my... Um, frustration on my side is the fact that if it is only the juice, what it suddenly does is a massive uh, conceptual limitation. And that limitation should be inspiring for perfumers and there are things that can be successful and there are many people that would smell that milky strawberry and they might write down on a panel test, teenage girl, and therefore it would be a tick. But if you think about the uh, conceptual range that is possible and achievable by olfaction alone, it is so muted and sometimes I grow so frustrated with the lack of ambition in that regard because maybe you can do teenage girl, maybe you can do angry, um, but you can't do communism. And I'm not saying that I would ever expect that to be the case, but I do think it is important to identify conceptual range because it limits the perfumer. Smell his mazju bud because you'll, you'll feel religion. Honestly. I think that's a great note to end on then. Uh, I know we're, we're, we're running out of time very quickly, so I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, if they do, I'll, I'll put it across. Thank you, Eddie. It was a very interesting discussion. And uh, what I would like to suggest is a slight paradigm shift. And perhaps we should make the audience, uh, the consumer, a little bit more responsible. Uh, challenge them to educate themselves because I believe that if you are a beginner in a the field then everybody who knows just a tiny bit more than you seems to be an expert and once you educate yourself you raise the bar for other people to be considered experts much higher so this is what I suggest that's a good point are there any other questions Maybe it's a stupid question, but I really wonder why do you think it's impossible to uh, portray communism or feminism through a perfume? Because no one understands the, the, the most people don't understand the, the so okay, let's say um, 
let's say you're doing something with nerlimbanol, nerlimbanol, or whatever, the one that Chandler Burr famously called, you know, the scent of dryness. Yeah, yeah. Nerlimbanol. Nor, nor right, okay, you get it. And you're saying, oh, well, the, everybody knows that this is the smell of dryness in my little world because we all read that thing that Chandler Burr wrote that one time. And then you put it out in a museum without any context, and people are like, hmm, I like it. They don't, they don't think conceptually about scent because they're not taught that way. We're not taught that way, you know? And that's where, I mean, that's where the work of, of these guys and, and other people who are working with communicating to the public really can help change and maybe help, help make that more possible. That's yeah, my answer. Yeah, that's true. But you, you, you gave, gave a possibility to milky strawberry being a, like uh, many people will say is the scent of a teenage girl and you're okay with that. But, you know, communism... I mean, we don't have just a juice, right? We have everything that's around that, like concepts and stuff and people who communicate stuff and bottles, textures, I don't know. Uh, for me, the answer lies somewhere in the questioning of, of how uh, meanings will be translated through scent. So if you think certain um, smells in, in your life will, will carry a meaning. Now, um, some scientific research would tell you that um, citrus smells will uh, give you a feeling of sharpness because of some innate neural connection that maybe people haven't discovered. Then uh, there's other research that will tell you that it is almost impossible to enjoy the smell of like rubbish because of the sulfurous uh, compounds. Again, it's kind of borderline innate, but like not quite. You would need to do further studies. Then there's the concept of association through, through nurture, that you, through your life, will, will gain uh, repetitive experiences um, uh, from smell, like washing or like your, your mother, and then she wears the same scent every night, and then, boom, you, you have a connection. But uh, the answer lies in, in semiotics and trying to separate the material smell with, with the meaning and not think that they're innately connected. And if you take the idea of communism, it's because... Uh, Communism doesn't have a smell. Uh, just, materials are related to, to real life uh, uh, experience. Um, sensory experiences uh, have uh, within in them a, a, a need to relate to, yeah. uh, to, to, to real life. I get it. And because there isn't any relation, there, it's almost impossible for the concept to be conveyed. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sorry to take your time, but uh, olfaction, it's, it's, it's made that way. I mean, there are studies that... Oh, for, for instance, the smell of feces for some African uh, indigenous uh, tribes, it's okay and it smells cool because they, they spend time with cows all, all the time. I mean, cultural code and uh, the this, this smell, it's always, can, like, it's so hard to... I've got... I may have an ID for you. You have your money, you keep your money, you buy cobalt in Africa, you sell it one time. With that money, you sell it another time. Then you sell it a third time, that cobalt in Africa then it will start to smell capitalism. <laughs> so, no worries. so what's the sound of communism and what's the taste of communism? And the reason that I think simply that those, that has more of a possibility is because um, more of a possibility, but it's very difficult to represent this concept or idea. The, okay, let's be more specific. The ideology of, of communism, not the word, or, or, but, but everything that communism represents, its literature, its values, its history, its suffering, uh, its uh, achievements, exploitation, etc. Something so specifically representational, if you don't have that linguistic or, or visual mode to work with, because uh, there aren't many people that would have experienced their sensory modalities in such a vivid way to, to have a memory that was linked to all of those values. I don't think it's impossible for someone to smell something uh, and say, I, this genuinely does because of maybe sense that they had engaged with at, at that time in their life under communist repression. It's not entirely impossible. Right. but your communism of, versus my communism, different locales. True, you know? which, which makes it, I, I think, almost of a, a defunct objective. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea that it could be... I'm not saying it is impossible. I'm saying I, I, I believe it to be almost impossible given the way the brain will re respond to smells. I have a question to you. How do you reconcile the idea that perfume cannot convey ideas and insisting on perfumers being trained 
in interpretation rather than getting nuances, understanding materials, so that I can actually control those materials to create details and layered structures. I think the reconciliation just lies in, in, in Bart, really, the, 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 the death of the author. You can make something uh, what, what you want. You can interpret things in the way that you want. Uh, not, not, someone would not expect a, an artist to have all of the answers to their artwork. Um, the artist will have a different vision for their artwork. I, I don't think that really matters so much. So whilst I'm concerned with the, the translation process, and I like to, to question it, there, there is still... A, a uh, sense that, that I love, there are sense that I feel naive to and, and playful with, and there are others that I criticize for their, their lack of ambition. But um, I don't think actually that it's really so important. The only important thing is the end result, the, the object you're confronting. Um, uh, yeah, that's my answer. Sorry. No, no, but I was a little bit tough, and you said something very wrong. Everybody is free to do whatever they want, and there is one thing that you have to protect. It's not your cash, it's your enthusiasm. That's the only vital thing that you have to protect. Because when you launch a perfume, you think that everything is creativity. But, but the, the rest is, is the nightmare. Production, distribution, returns and refunds to the trade. So at the end of the day, it becomes a nightmare. So you have to protect your enthusiasm every day. If you don't protect it, then you are not an expert, you are gone with the wind. So the only key thing is the enthusiasm. It's not the cash, because from your enthusiasm, cash will come, as long as you keep it strongly with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And remember, buy cobalt in Africa. It's better. Can I just say one more thing about safety? Um, I, I don't know why I'm obsessed with the safety concept, but the difference between working in a house and then working on your own, I think some very niche... Um, self-taught brands don't follow the same regulatory as we do and regulatory can be very constricting um, and we work really hard to make things smell good within those confines um, and I don't think consumers realize that some other small brands don't do the same and that there are regulations for a reason and they should be followed and if you don't I don't know you should <laughs> We can bring, bring the education system. None of us been trained on smelling. No, we train for a, a lot of other skill, but smell from kindergarten all the way to university, never. That's also a lot of general consumer, they have nothing, no vocabulary while it's very limited. They just can say, mm, smell nice, I like it. So how, as we as a community, how to promote the education? So, so, so my nonprofit is devoted yeah. to just that thing, and I totally agree with you. But I think about it sometimes. I'm like, oh, yeah, we need to train people on smell. We need to train people on smell. But, I mean, not to be provocative, but why? To create more consumers? or to create more people who have a creative output that will allow them to express themselves. So it's not just education, it's the right approach to education. You know, sorry, I don't know if that's helpful to, to what you're saying, but I agree, you know, but, but I think we need to just make sure that we're not just, a lot of brands, you know, come to the Institute and say, oh, we want to work with you because we want to educate the public in order to buy our perfume. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not education. The, you that is be... not education, right, there's exactly. a purpose. But that is something in the perfume industry that's a real problem, I think. People really, they see education in the context of sales and capitalism. So that's, that's all I have to say about that. Oh, well, thank you very much. I think we've run out of time, but I appreciate you coming today. And, and thank you very much to the panelists for being part of the discussion. Okay.